I now want to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Michael Lacona. Uh, he is coming to us. Uh, lives in Atlanta, Georgia. Is on faculty here at HBU, uh, our uh, wonderful school in a in our uh, the west side of Houston with us. Uh, we're so glad that he's uh, gathered here. There's a lot about him you need to know that you may not know, and, and I want to share a few things with you, and not in the manner of a roast, but uh, just to give you an idea for him. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree in music performance, saxophone. Now, when I discovered this, I was immediately discouraged that we didn't ask him to bring the saxophone. <laughs> and play us a couple of tunes, but that's an opportunity missed and perhaps another time. Uh, during his undergraduate studies, he uh, had a strong desire to know God better, to, to learn Koine Greek, New Testament Greek, and he committed himself to that project and later committed, a math, uh, not committed, uh, completed, he may have committed too, but he com completed a master's in religious studies. And, and as he gets toward the end of that first bit of work, questions about the faith begin to arise, and he wants to deal with them. A principle among them, the resurrection, which the Apostle Paul mentioned might be kind of important for Christians to understand and know in 1 Corinthians 15. And so it led to him in his journey and getting his PhD in New Testament from the University of Pretoria. There are faculty members from HBU here, friends from his board. His organization, apologetic organization, Risen Jesus, uh, is represented here. It's a marvelous site and resource. Uh, so we have someone who, in my mind at least, the number one person right now in the country talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Now, that's just my opinion. But, and I know they're like belly buttons. Everybody has an opinion. But he's solid, and we're going to be so blessed by what he's going to say. And so he's speaking on the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, and he's going to walk us through some of that and help us come to grips with some of that. Anything I said wrong thus far, Mike? Okay, now's the chance to correct it. All right. no. Would you welcome uh, to the chancel area here at Memorial Drive Presbyterian Church, Dr. Michael Lacombe. Thanks, Clay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, and good evening. It is wonderful to be with you all, and uh, just uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, it's been great to get to know Clay, your pastor of uh, adult education today. We spent about three hours, picked me up at the airport just after uh, noon, and then we spent three hours, we talked in the car, we went and ate some really great Mexican food, and uh, enjoyed, I really enjoy his sense of humor. And those of you, I can see a lot of you nodding now, a great sense of humor. But what probably many of you don't know, his sense of humor gets even better when he's got a few margaritas in him. <laughs> in all honesty, I don't know what, what your policy on alcohol is at this church. <laughs> but I, I, to be honest, the only thing he drank at lunch was Dr. Pepper. Okay, so, but great to be here. Thank you for having me. It's great to see my colleagues from HBU, Robert Gagnon, and who's a New Testament scholar, and Jerry Walls, who is a philosopher. And honestly, I think at HBU, Happenden Baptist University, we have just got a tremendous faculty there. I, I really think we've, we've got one of the best programs in, in the universe. Uh, we really do, and, and we all get along really well. There's a diversity of it. We're all evangelicals, and we all believe in the essentials, the fundamentals of the faith. But after that, there's some diversity. And I, I like that. Uh, I, I joke with my friends who teach at other universities and say, you know, you guys uh, teach people what to think. At HBU, we teach our students how to think. And, um, and I like that. And um, also Hunter, he came up and met me, uh, uh, one of my former students, and glad he's here. But great to, Bill? Hey, great to see you, man. Another one, current student. So uh, great to see you, man. Um, so, wonderful to be here, um, and so we're, we just celebrated Easter less than two weeks ago, so I'm happy to be talking about the resurrection of Jesus, okay? So, right now, we're looking at about 51 years removed from the song Imagine, 
which was written by John Lennon and his wife, Yoko Ono. 51 years ago, they penned or composed the song. It would become the number one hit of Lennon's career. Now, the music to imagine is very pleasant to the ear. The lyrics, let's take a look at them. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. So we just want to see that, imagine that atheism is true. There's no heaven to go to. There's no hell to go to. Uh, this life is all there is, so you need to live for today. Enjoy life as much as possible. Don't worry about an afterlife. God does not exist. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for, and uh, well, no religion, too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. So get rid of your worldview. Um, abandon that. Get rid of any kind of patriotism or love for your country, and we can all uh, live in peace. We can all give along, whether um, conservative or progressive, Republican, Democrat, capitalist, communist, and even the Taliban. We can all get along, and we can live life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us, and the world will be as one. These lyrics, naive as they are, were meant to persuade, as Lennon himself acknowledged in an interview. He said, the song is anti-religious, anti-nationalistic, anti-conventional, anti-capitalistic, but because it is sugar-coated, it is accepted. Now I understand what you have to do. Put your political message across with a little honey. So what I want to do is I want to take a moment and take up uh, Lenin's challenge, and let's imagine that there is no God, no heaven, no hell, that this life is all there is. And let's just say that some kind of twist of fate, because without God, that's what it is, a twist of fate, whatever happens, and you're not living in the United States. In fact, you're just one of the more than six billion people um, in the world who don't have the privilege of living in the U.S. And let's say that actually you have been living, grew up, and now you're living in Ukraine. And due to what's going on in the war right now, um, it's significantly impacted your family. Bombs have, have uh, burst, and every one of your deeply loved family members and spouses and children, they've all been killed by Putin's bombs. Um, and you've lost your house because that's been destroyed. You've lost your way of, of making a living. Um, all your life savings have been uh, vaporized uh, because the economic uh, eco economy over there is, is just nothing. And that's where you're at. All your family and, and loved ones have been killed in this. And you're thinking, wow, even if there is a coup in Russia and they arrest or kill Putin, I mean, how do you account for all this violence and grief in my life that has just turned my life upside down? Um, there's just nothing that can get this back uh, for me. It's, it's gone. Uh, injustices will ultimately go unanswered. And then I think about people like um, Mother Teresa, who gave up all the comforts of life uh, in order to help the poor and destitute, to make their lives a little bit better. If, if God does not exist, then goodness goes unrewarded. And then I think about death. Now, um, we have a dog at home, and her name is Piper. And she's a little West Highland Terrier, and we love that dog. Hey, you can do stuff to my children, but do not do anything to my dog, <laughs> you know? This dog is awesome, but she's our second dog. Our first dog, and I can't put her photo up here because I'm, I'm still impacted. We had to put her down three years ago. We had her for 16 and a half years. Same kind of dog. Her name was Nessie after the Loch Ness Monster. And it just got, you know, we loved this dog, and it just got to the point, 16 and a half years old, 
we had to put her down. She had diabetes, she was in pain, she didn't want to go on walks anymore, and then she got to a point she wouldn't eat any, anymore. And so we knew it was time, and we took her to the vet. And so we're all in this, the whole family, and we're in this little room, and there's this table here. And so the vet has me holding the dog, and we all said uh, goodbye to her. So I'm, I'm holding her from underneath, and he takes some uh, chemical and, and injects it in her IV and puts, and she goes to sleep. And then he put another chemical in, and it stopped her heart. Um, and as, you know, uh, after he put her to sleep, I, I laid her down and I'm petting her, and he put the other chemical in, and it stopped her heart, and then he put the stethoscope on her, and he said, she's gone. And all of us in the room are, are weeping. Now, my wife, my nickname for my wife is Spock. Um, because in our 35 years of marriage, she's only seen me cry five times. And it's not that, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, it takes a big man to cry, I understand that, but it takes an even bigger man to laugh at that man, right? And I thought you guys would like that. The rest will get it later, okay? Um, so, but it's not that I have this thing against crying, it's just I, I just don't feel like crying. But I cried when my two parents died, uh, I cried when my stepdad died, I cried when a good friend died, and I cried when my dog died. And my wife will tell you that if you took those four other, my, 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 my mom, my stepdad, my dad, and my good friend who died, and you, all the tears that came from my eyes, and you added them all up, it was a fraction of what she saw when my dog died. And it's not that I love the dog more than the others. That's not at all the case. It's because I have the assurance that these, my loved ones and friend, are with Christ in heaven. Um, I have no such assurance about my dog. Now, C.S. Lewis, William Lane Craig, and some others think that our pets are going to be in heaven. I hope so. I'd love to think about my dog running around up there. Um, but I don't know. And the thought that my dog was just alive one minute ago and now could be forever gone, never to live again, was crushing. And I thought, if that's the way it is with a stupid little pet, how much more when you lose a loved one? If God does not exist, injustices go unanswered, goodness goes unrewarded, and death is final. To imagine such is a horrifying thing. I sincerely hope it is false. But there is another way to look at things, another narrative, and it goes like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God loved the world so much that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. That's some awesome news, if it's true. Well, how will we know it's true? What kind of test could we give? Well, Jesus had critics who asked the same kind of question. You're, you're claiming to be God's uniquely divine son. You're claiming that our eternal destiny is directly linked to how we respond to your message. Well, I mean, come on. It, if Clay said that on a Sunday morning, we would think he was a few french fries short of a Happy Meal, wouldn't we? I mean, you, we can understand why Jesus' critics felt that way. And so they said, show us a sign, give us some evidence. And he said, I'll give you one sign, my resurrection. So just a couple of passages. On one occasion he says, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three day, days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then in John, Jesus cleanses the temple. He overturns the tables there, chases out the money changers and the merchants. And, and they say to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? What, how can you show you have the authority to do these things in the temple? And Jesus said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And the Jews said, Jewish leader said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body, and the next verse talks about, verse 22 says, his disciples came to understand this after he had been raised from the dead. So the bottom line is this, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, 
He is a false prophet and a failed Messiah whom no rational person should follow. But if he did rise from the dead, then he did so in confirmation of his personal radical claims, and that gives us something very serious to think about. So this, this is an interesting test. It's something that you really, if you rise from the dead, um, we got to listen to him. But you know, the test doesn't really give us much today if we can't verify Jesus rose from the dead in some kind of a sense, right? I mean, great, you say this, but is it just a matter of the Bible says it, I have to believe it, and that settles it? It's just purely by faith? If that's the case, then it, it might have been a good test for his disciples, but it wouldn't be for us today, right? So let's look. Is there any kind of evidence that we could wrap our arms around that's available today that a rational person could look at and say, yeah, some pretty decent evidence for that, that Jesus rose from the dead. Well, there is some good evidence. And so I'm going to build a positive case for Jesus' resurrection here. And I'm going to make it so simple, so painfully simple, that even a Southern Baptist can understand. Now, I can say that because I worked for the Southern Baptist Convention for six years. And I'll be honest with you, when I went into it, I had this concept that Southern Baptists, all of them were just these backward, anti-intellectuals. And um, as after working with them for six years, I have to admit, I was only 80% correct. <laughs> um, in, in reality, there are some really good Southern Baptists. And um, so, yeah. Um, sorry, we're going to make this simple. So we're going to start off with this. This very simple fact on which virtually every scholar who studies the subject agrees. Whether conservative, moderate, progressive Christian, whether Jewish, agnostic, atheist, they all seem to agree. Now, of course, you're going to have some out on the fringe. Like, there's like less than a dozen bona fide historians in the world who say Jesus never existed. Less than a dozen out of the tens of thousands, less than a dozen would say Jesus probably didn't exist. I mean, you've got about that many historians who say the Holocaust didn't occur, okay? I mean, that's how ridiculous it is. It's like the, some of the contestants on, remember American Idol, and in the opening episode, you'd have these people come in, and they, they think they're just really talented, and the judges are rolling their eyes, and they just don't recognize that they just don't have the talent. That's how most scholars, historians, look at people who say Jesus never existed. Um, they just don't give them any time. So when I talk about the majority of critical scholars today, I'm, I'm talking about across the wide spectrum, not just Christian scholars, okay? And they will, virtually everyone will agree that Jesus' disciples claimed that he rose from the dead and appeared to them. Notice I'm not saying that they agree that Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to his apostles. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not even saying at this point that they believed that Jesus rose and appeared to them. I'm just making the, the very clear and simple fact that Jesus' disciples claimed that he rose from the dead and appeared to them. All right, so why is this the case? Why, why believe that? Well, let's look at a few things. Number one, you've got a guy named Paul. Now, Paul was a Jewish leader, a Pharisee, by his own testimony. And, and by the way, we're just going to look at, at this kind of as a historian, okay? And I'm going to approach the text not as a divinely inspired text, not as an inerrant text, just as a text written in the first century, all right? So you got Paul here. And he's going to, in the letter of 1 Corinthians, which was written somewhere between the years 53 and 57, or within roughly 25 years after Jesus' crucifixion, in a few verses, verses he's going to um, tell us something about the resurrection. So he says, I delivered to you what I also received. Now these two terms, delivered and received, are important because they connote the imparting of oral tradition. It, typically used later on of the rabbis who were imparting oral tradition. And so he said, I delivered to you when? 
when he established the first Presbyterian church of Corinth around the year 51. Now, of course, when I'm talking to a Baptist church, I say the first Baptist church of Corinth, right? Or the first assemblies of God uh, of, of Corinth. Um, when in Rome, right? <laughs> so he says, I delivered to you around the year 51 when he established the first Presbyterian church of Corinth. What I had also received, he received it beforehand, and he would have received this from the Jerusalem apostles, or at least he knows it goes back to the Jerusalem apostles. And so he's given oral tradition. If you notice what this looks like, it's long, short, long, short. That's called parallelism. And that was to assist in memorizing. Because you see only about 10% of the people in antiquity at that time, estimates are only about 10% could read, and maybe only half of those could read and write. So the way that they learned a lot of things, they didn't have television, they would learn through oral tradition. Now, of course, tradition would be passed around like the game of telephone. You know, you pass it to the, and it gets to the back and it's to something totally different. Of course, that kind of stuff happened back then. But oral tradition worked differently. And they were very careful to pass this along and to maintain its integrity. And so they'd formulate these ways to make it easy to memorize. And so here's this oral tradition that Paul had received from the apostles that he's passed along to them in the year 51, within about 20 years of the crucifixion. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared. And so you've got the death, burial, resurrection, and appearances of Jesus that are mentioned. And then in the verses that come right after that, he's going to mention a bunch of these appearances. He talks about he appeared to Peter, then to the 12, then to more than 500 at one time. And Paul adds, most of these people are still alive, although some have died. In other words, they're still around if you want to talk to them. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And then Paul said, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now, what's interesting is when you go to Galatians chapter 1 and Galatians chapter 2, Paul says that he met with, in Galatians 1, an undisputed letter of Paul, as is 1 Corinthians. Scholars will debate on whether Paul wrote some of the letters in the New Testament, but they're all in agreement he wrote 1 Corinthians. They're all in agreement he wrote Galatians. I'm only going to quote from those letters that scholars are unanimous that Paul wrote. And so in Galatians chapter 1, Paul says he met with Peter, the lead apostle, for 15 days, and he also saw James, Jesus' brother. And in Galatians 2, he says 14 years later, he goes back up to Jerusalem to run the gospel message past the pillars of the church, and he names them Peter, James, and John. So he's seeing Peter and James again, and now he's meeting John, probably John the son of Zebedee, another one of Jesus' three closest disciples. So you got Peter and John, two of Jesus' three closest disciples, and then Jesus' brother James. That's pretty good stuff, don't you think? And then Paul says, whether I or they that is the other apostles, this is what we preached and this is what you believed. So we can get back to what um, the apostles were preaching through Paul here. And by the way, in Galatians chapter 2, he said, I ran the gospel message past them to ensure that I was preaching the same thing they were preaching. And he said, they added nothing to what I said. They gave me the right hand of fellowship. In other words, you're good, you're good Paul, fist bump, keep up the good work, brother. So it's like, all right, when we hear Paul in the gospel message, we are likewise hearing the voice of the Jerusalem apostles. Now, this does not mean that everything that Paul taught was exactly what the Jerusalem apostles were doing. We know that they had some disagreements. But we do know that when he's talking about the gospel message, we're hearing the voice of the Jerusalem apostles. And this is what it was. I, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, I want to remind you of the gospel message I preached to you. And then verses three through five, Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised, etc. So we know Paul, the other apostles as well as Paul are proclaiming that Jesus rose and appeared to them. You say, but wait a minute, Mike, that's all in the Bible. That's like, like all Christians. Well, yeah, I mean, don't, if we're going to try to show that the Christians are saying Jesus rose from the dead, don't you want to look at Christian sources? We're not at this point even saying it's true that he rose from the dead. We're just making the just so simple claim that Jesus, that they were saying that Jesus rose and had appeared to them. 
And this is something that's undisputed among scholars. And then you've got oral tradition. I already mentioned the oral tradition in that creed in 1 Corinthians 15. And then you have speeches in the book of Acts. Now, there's a whole lot more speeches than what I've said here, but in these particular speeches, you have an apostle like Peter or Paul who are talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And most uh, critical New Testament scholars, there's a variety of opinions. I mean, nobody thinks that these are transcripts of what they actually said. I mean, you can read these speeches and like these sermons in like five minutes. Have you ever heard a sermon that was only five minutes? You wish, right? No, these are sermon summaries. These are summaries of the apostolic preaching at that time. And so we have the apostles proclaiming Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and appearances. And then you have written tradition. Certainly in all four Gospels, it talks about the resurrection. You've got a guy named Clement of Rome who uh, may very well have been a disciple of the apostle Peter. And then a guy named Polycarp who was probably a disciple of the apostle John. Now, anybody married in here at this, right? I, I'm sorry, anybody pregnant in here right now? Anybody pregnant? No? Okay, well, some of you are going to get married, you're going to get pregnant. If it's a boy, you're thinking of names, so just remember Polycarp, okay? <laughs> now, oh, so, if, if, here's something I do. So, if someone says, well, how do you know the apostles were claiming Jesus rose? I just have in my mind the acronym PAL, P-O-W, PAL, Paul, oral tradition, written tradition. And then I can unpack it. I got Paul, I got Paul saying this in 1 Corinthians 15, I got the oral tradition, the creed, the sermon summaries and acts, and then written tradition, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the four gospels, and then Clement of Rome and Polycarp. It's easy to remember. I got nine sources and all, but all just unpacked through the acronym PAL. So we know Jesus' apostles claimed that he rose and appeared to them. Now, here's where it just becomes real simple. We only have two options. He either appeared to them or he did not. Can you think of another option? Jerry, you're, you're a philosopher, a logician. Can you think of any other option? It, it, the law of excluded middle, it seems to me here, right? Can you think of any other option? He either appeared to them or he did not. Jerry's saying no. And he's saying don't call on me again. All right. So let's start off and let's just consider the option that he did not appear to them. Well, now that gives us two options. They either thought he appeared to them or he did not think, they did not think that he appeared to them. Jerry, any other options? He says, no, I'm, I'm okay, cool. So now let's just look at they thought he appeared. So Jesus' apostles claimed Jesus rose and appeared. He did not appear to them, but they thought he appeared. Well, now we've got a couple of options. They were experiencing hallucinations, or Jesus had an identical twin. <laughs> so let's just focus for a moment on hallucinations, all right? Now, this would seem plausible, right? I mean, they're grieving over Jesus' death, and so maybe they experience these Grief hallucinations. You hear about these. When my mom died a few months later, my dad experienced a grief hallucination. He woke up in the middle of the night. He believed he saw her smiling at him in a chair. He had a grief visual hallucination. Okay? At least that's how I would say it. I mean, it's possible she appeared to him. I, I wouldn't rule that out. But um, I think it's more likely he experienced a grief hallucination. Well, here, here's a hallucination. All right. A hallucination... A lot of studies have been done on hallucinations. They are false sensory perceptions. You think you see something, but it's not really there. Or you hear something that's not there. Or you smell or taste something that's not there. Or, um, remember when you got your first cell phone and you put it on vibrate when you came to church or a lecture or something, and in the middle of it, you thought it vibrated and you pulled it out and you thought you got that first text message, right? And you looked at it, and it's like, nobody loves me. That is called a tactile hallucination. You think you felt something, but you really didn't. Or you had a dream. You ever have a dream that you're falling and you wake up, right? That is called a kinesthetic hallucination. So see, we all have these kind of hallucinations at times. Well, only 
approximately, a lot of studies have been done on hallucinations, approximately only 7% of those who are grieving the loss of a loved one experience a visual hallucination. Only 7%. Okay? So that's one thing. Another thing is because hallucinations are something going on in the mind of an individual. They have no external referent to them, no external reality. So in that sense, they're like dreams. And I couldn't wake up my wife in the middle of the night and say, honey, I'm having a dream. I'm in Maui. Go back to sleep. Join me in my dream, and let's have a free vacation. Right? You can't do that. Because why? It's going on in my head. I can't make her have the same dream. Um, now, she might dream she's in Maui, go back to sleep and dream. I might dream, but we're not having the same dream. You know, it's not like uh, we wake up and she says, man, when, when, when you were body surfing and that wave took you down and it held you under for a while, I got kind of concerned. And I said, yeah, you know, I was kind of concerned too. I, I was losing, I, I didn't think I could hold my breath that long. You know, we're not participating in the same dream. Why? Because it's going on in your, in your mind. It has no external reality. Same thing with hallucinations. You, you might be experiencing a hallucination, but you're not having the same one. Now, years ago, our family lived in Virginia Beach, and half of the SEAL teams are there in the Virginia Beach area. SEAL Team 6 is in the Virginia Beach area, called Dev Group. And so they go through this thing called Hell Week that's the first thing to become a SEAL. And they start on a Sunday night and they go all the way through like noon on Saturday. And during the whole week, they only, they're just exercising, doing stuff and being uncomfortable the whole week. And they only get three to five hours of sleep the entire week. So due to sleep deprivation, um, a, a number of the SEALs, it wasn't a formal kind of thing. It was an informal where I interviewed probably a few dozen of them. And I found out about 80% of those that I interviewed said that they experienced a hallucination of some sort. And one guy said um, he saw a train coming across the ocean at him, and a bunch of them were in a raft, and, and he tried to convince them. And he said, you idiot, there's no trains out here in the Pacific Ocean. But he was so convinced he rolled out of the raft, and they had to stop and pick him up. Another guy who, I remember he was a lieutenant, he said he didn't have any hallucinations, but he remembered a guy in the raft was swinging this paddle. And they said, what are you doing? He says, I'm trying to hit these dolphins that keep jumping over the raft. And I said, did you see the dolphins? No. Did anyone else? No, they were having their own hallucinations, you know. So you can't make someone else see your own, your hallucination, because it's your hallucination that's going on in your mind. All right. So, when you take that into consideration, you cannot experience a group hallucination. The only other option is that everybody in the room or wherever you're at are simultaneously experiencing a hallucination. Now, can you imagine, it's like, suppose all of us in this, we get tired and we go to sleep and we all experience the same dream. Not gonna happen. It's not going to happen with a hallucination either. So group hallucinations, you got that problem. And then, what about Paul? Oh, by the way, and it's not 7% of the disciples that experience. It's 100% of them claim to have seen the risen Jesus. He appeared to all the apostles. He appeared to the 12, right? And then you got the group, and the, so it's 100% instead of 7%. And then you got the group, three group appearances, to the 12, to more than 500, to all the apostles. It's like, okay, that doesn't work. And then you got Paul. Paul thought Jesus was a failed prophet and a false messiah. So Jesus would have been the last person in the universe that Paul would have expected to see or wanted to see. So it doesn't account for that. If you go for an empty tomb, it wouldn't account for why the tomb's empty. So the hallucination hypothesis does not work. It is one of the worst historical hypotheses out there. So, we can rule that out. What about an identical twin? This was posited by an atheist philosophy professor named uh, Greg Cavan. In his PhD dissertation, he said, yeah, hallucinations don't work. I don't believe God exists, so there's, there's resurrection could not have happened. Hallucinations, lies, all this stuff, it doesn't work. That only leaves one plausible option. Jesus must have had an identical twin. And so, when he 
showed himself to Jesus' disciples, they thought that Jesus had been raised from the dead because he claimed to be Jesus. Now, let me ask, is there, are there any identical twins in here? Where? Cool. Awesome. I'm going to ask you the same question. I've probably asked this three, four dozen uh, identical twins. Um, you and, and your brother, you can fool people? Yeah. Okay. Um, are you married? Yeah. Okay. Is your brother married? Yeah. Can you fool your spouses? No. no. <laughs> okay. Um, can, can you fool people who have known you for years? Yeah. For how long? He said yes. For how long? You can fool your dad. For how long? Like if you're standing there talking to your dad, could you fool him then? Yeah. For how long? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Really? That long? Okay. Well, that's longer than I've heard from others. But notice, ten minutes. You, these disciples had lived with Jesus for at least one and a half years, perhaps even as long as three years. If this guy comes along and claims he's Jesus, he's not going to be able to fool him that long, would he? And because they're going to notice a difference in the facial expressions, the body mannerisms, uh, the voice inflections, right? That's going to be those things. That's the reason your wives can tell the two of you apart, because they're, they're just living with you. They know the differences. People who are strangers or don't know them that well, you know, you can fool them for a little bit. But even people like his dad... They could fool him 10 minutes. That's it. Um, and then the, the gag's over. He's going to be able to notice the difference. So that's, it's just not going to work. And then you think about it, identical twin. Okay, so Jesus is gone. This guy who is probably separated at birth, now he sees the, what the Romans did to Jesus. They scourged him, and then they crucified him. Um, and he's going to come along and say, hey, guess what, guys? It didn't work. It's kind of like the guy that goes up to the conquistadors and they say, what did you do with the gold? I swallowed it. So what are you going to do about it? You know, it's like, what are you going to do about it, Romans? I just saw you scourge Jesus to the bone and crucify. You really think he's going to do it? If I had an identical twin or someone that I looked like and saw what the Romans said, I am not hanging around. <laughs> I'm getting out of town. So this doesn't work. And in fact, I debated Greg Cavan uh, a few years back on the resurrection. I think it was 2012. And before our debate, he said, Mike, I don't want you to mention the twin identical twin hypothesis because I no longer believe it. So like he was the only one in the world who believed it, and he no longer believes it. So <laughs> that doesn't work. So now let's go to the other side of this logic tree, at least this other branch. So Jesus' apostles claimed he rose and appeared to them. He did not appear to them, and they did not think he appeared to them. Now, they either lied about it or they didn't mean to intend. They didn't intend to communicate that he actually rose from the dead. Resurrection and appearances were just metaphors for something else. So let's go for a moment with lied. Now, did the disciples lie about the appearances? Now, this one is something I don't, I'm not aware of a single scholar today or for a very long time who thinks the disciples lied about it. Why? Because we have multiple reports about the disciples, how they were willing to suffer continuously and even willing to die for their gospel proclamation. So um, now some of the reports are late and may not be so trustworthy and some might be embellished or amplified. And so, again, we can't trust them because maybe they're written just a few centuries later. doesn't mean they didn't, but it's like in the eyes of historians, it's like, I just don't know. We're in no man's land here, okay? Um, but there are a number of accounts from the first century that we can rely on. So, for example, Paul, in his undisputed letters, he talks about how he had been beaten, that he had been stoned, he'd been imprisoned. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says about he and the apostles, they die daily, meaning they are facing the possibility of being killed on a daily basis for preaching the gospel. And then you've got uh, the book of Acts, and that talks about how several of the apostles and 
and other early Christians like Stephen, a deacon in, uh, at that time, that they were either persecuted and or uh, martyred for their faith. Um, you've got uh, John, John's gospel. In John chapter 21, it's uh, uh, Jesus and Peter are walking along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and he, he tells Peter how he's going to die as a martyr. He talks about crucifixion. Well, John is writing this in the late first century. The accounts of Peter's execution happened about 30 years earlier. So John is actually reporting the martyrdom of Peter. In that. And then you've got Josephus. He mentions the stoning of James, the brother of Jesus. And you've got Clement of Rome, who mentions the persecution of, of many Christians at that time. He talks about the persecution and torture and execution of two um, Christian women. And he mentions the uh, persecution and probably the martyrdom of Peter and Paul. So you got all these first century church, uh, sources that are reliable, and they're talking about how the, the disciples suffered persecution, and even some of them died as Christian martyrs. They were proclaiming the resurrection. You say, well, wait a minute, Mike. There are Muslims we know of that are willing to give up of their lives. It doesn't mean that Islam's true. Well, that's true. It doesn't. A lot of Christians die today as martyrs. Doesn't mean it's true what they believe. But it means they believe it's true. You don't have a, a Muslim go to a, Al-Qaeda, and he's, how, how can I serve Allah? Well, we want you to strap a bomb on your back and go in this building and blow up all these people. And the person thinks, ah, Muhammad was a false prophet. The Quran is not the word of God. If I go blow up all these innocent people, God may send me to hell. Sign me up. No, they're doing it because they believe it's true. Islam is true, and they're willing to suffer and die for it. Same thing with the early disciples. The fact that they were willing to endure continuous persecution, the threat of death, and even at least in some of their cases, death by martyrdom, shows that they sincerely believed what they were proclaiming was true. The disciples were not only proclaiming Jesus rose and appeared to them, they actually believed it. And so we can rule out lies here. What about metaphor? So, this varies amongst skeptical scholars. There's a guy named George Nicholsberg, and he said, well, resurrection was just a metaphor to say that Jesus had been exalted in heaven as a Jewish martyr. And he was, there were many Jewish martyrs before him, and they used this language, resurrection, to say that God had vindicated them by exalting them in heaven. And Jesus is just the most recent to get in this long line of Jewish martyrs. So it's a metaphor. The problem is he can't provide a single example where resurrection is used in this sense. And then secondly, it's, this is, I think, the most easily refuted of all the alternative hypotheses because Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 20 says, Christ is the first fruits of those who sleep. Up or are dead. So he's not the most recent to get in a long line of Jewish martyrs. He's the first to be raised from the dead in a resurrection body. So it's not a metaphor in that sense. And then you got John Dominic Cross and another skeptical New Testament scholar who says, well, they didn't believe that Jesus had actually been raised from the dead. The metaphor of resurrection just meant Jesus' teachings still live on. And we can almost kind of sense his presence when we take the Eucharist. If you want to know if Jesus is still alive, come and join us. See how we worship and love one another. Do you think that would have persuaded Paul? <laughs> He's out persecuting the Christians because he thinks that it's an aberrant cult from Judaism. He believes it's God's will to destroy this cult that Jesus had started. Do you think Paul's going to say, you know what? I know I might lose my soul over this, but I just really like that metaphor. I mean, it's just nuts. The, these guys come up with all these explanations. I just think they don't even really think through it. They just want to come up with something to justify their atheistic beliefs. Metaphor doesn't work. So now we can eliminate this half of the logic tree. 
And we know that the disciples claimed Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to them because he actually appeared to them. But we're not home yet. Because you see, there's two options here. He either died and appeared to them, or he did not die and appeared to them. Jerry? Okay, he says I'm one. Okay, so let's consider he, he did not die. So the way that this kind of works is Jesus was on the cross, and they took him off the cross while he was still alive. Maybe they thought he was, he was dead, but he really wasn't. Um, or if we really want to get kind of creative, hey, remember that young rich man that came to Jesus and said, what must I do to have eternal life? And he said, sell all you have and give to the poor and follow me, and you'll have eternal life. And, and he walks away sad because he's rich and he, he just doesn't want to do it. Maybe he felt guilty. And later on he says, okay, I'll get Jesus' favor. I will bribe the guards at the cross and then I will pay a physician. The best room, not, not government health care. The best private health care I can get to give to, to Jesus. And maybe he'll let me have eternal life. Okay, so they take him off the cross and they keep the secret, and they put him in the tomb, and they give him all sorts of medicine and herbs and things. Now, I don't know if you've done much study on crucifixion or scourging. Remember Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ? Well, before that came out, I spent six months studying all the ancient literature I could find on crucifixion. It was the most disturbing research I've ever done. There were times I just had to close the books and walk away. I was just so troubled by what I was reading. It was brutal. And um, I mean, I won't get into all the details, but I mean, it's really disturbing stuff. The Gospels don't talk about it that much. Why? Because the Gospel authors are writing to people who knew very well what crucifixion was like. Probably just about all of the readers of the Gospels they had seen crucifixions. It was a common thing. They knew what it was like. It, you didn't need to have it described back in the first century. And it was, so how accurate was Gibson's movie? It was pretty accurate. The scourging scene, very accurate. Josephus reports at least two occasions when scourging happened, people were uh, whipped to the bone. They were whipped to the bone. You could actually see their bones. Um, so, I mean, now, did it go through the hands? Probably not palms, it probably went through the wrists. Were they tied to the cross? Probably not. Um, did they have a seat? No, there was no seat that would um, uh, nullify the, the process of crucifixion. You would have these nails through your wrists, and, and if you take your finger and you like press in there and move it around, you'll feel a little tingly. Well, that's called your sensory motor median nerve. It's the same nerve that's your funny bone. You know, when you hit it on a desk, it's like, oh, you know. That's what this is. So they're putting a nail through that. So any little movement would be like taking a pair of pliers and crushing the funny bone. And now you've got one or two uh, nails through your feet, and it really hurts hanging on the cross. There's no seat. So you allow yourself to hang by your nails in the hands to take the pressure off your feet. But when you're in this position, um, it's straining on your intercostal muscles and it's shallow breathing and it's easier to inhale than to exhale. So you get all this carbon dioxide buildup and unless you expel that, um, you will get painful convulsions. And so you have to push up on your pierced feet, pull up on those nails in your hands, exhale and go down. And now for the next couple minutes, it's very shallow breathing and then you gotta do this and then go down and that's why you, they would break your legs if they wanted to expedite the execution. You couldn't push up anymore. You'd be in a down position. You'd have this carbon dioxide buildup and painful convulsions and die. Okay? So you've been scourged, whipped to the bone. You have been impaled to a cross. And you have died this brutal death. Um, there's a pathologist who taught at Columbia. And... He talks about how the crown of thorns, uh, you've got a complex system of nerves in your head, and so uh, if that was digging into your skull, um, just any little breeze would, would bump those thorns up against some of the nerves in your head, and you'd feel 
horrible pain like that of a dentist drill going into your, your tooth without any kind of uh, anesthesia. And then you would have had intense thirst. And because of all the brutalities happening to the body, you would experience muscle cramps all over. Now, I don't know about you guys. Uh, I'm 60 years old, and I can tell you that within the last three years, um, I'm getting much more muscle cramps at night. And it's happening sometimes in the middle of the night when I'm sleeping. And it's like, it's brutal. Um, and it's like, what do I do? And it's, it's brutal. And can you imagine you're scourged to the bone and you're up impaled on this cross and every time the wind blows, you get this like dentist drill pain and you've got this also the funny bone thing going on here and then you've got annoying insects on your wounds and then you also have muscle cramps going on all over your body. It's just a horrible way to die. Um, now, imagine even if you were removed from the cross prematurely and medically assisted, what would you look like just a few days later? Would you be able to convince anyone that you were resurrected with an immortal body? <laughs> now, alive, yes. Resurrected, not a chance. So that doesn't work. So now that only leaves us with one option. His disciples claim that he rose from the dead and appeared to them. He appeared to them. He actually died. And he rose. That's pretty cool stuff. I mean, it's the only option that works here, folks. It's the only option that works. He rose from the dead. It's the only thing that can explain this very simple fact that the disciples claimed he rose from the dead and appeared to them. And I get excited about that. And the reason I do is because, you know, life is, is difficult, isn't it? We all have challenges. All of us do. And maybe some of you right now have some challenges more than the rest of us. Maybe, maybe you're, you have a lot of pain, chronic pain. Um, I ruptured a disc in my back back in 1998. It was like some of the worst pain I've ever had. I remember I, I had surgery that corrected it, but I thought, you know what? If I had to live with this the rest of my life, this is back in the days of Kevorkian, <laughs> remember that? I was like, man, if God wouldn't get mad at me, I'd have him put me down. You know, uh, maybe some of you are experiencing that kind of pain, and, and there's just no hope, and you're, and, and you're just discouraged. Or maybe you lost your job, or, or maybe you have a relationship, a spouse, or your kids or something in that relation, or a romance, or some relationship, it's blown up, and you're just heartbroken. Or, or maybe you just lost your job and, or your house or something. And you know what? God has not called us to happiness. I wish he had, but that's not his, his goal for this life. His goal for this life is not our happiness. It's our holiness. So that we will be conformed to the image of his son Jesus, that we will become more like him. As my friend Jerry says, he wrote a book on, on, on heaven, hell, and purgatory, and he talks about God's will as our sanctification. And, and that's what he wants for us, our sanctification. And so whatever we're going through now, look, this, this life is just very brief. And whatever you're experiencing, one second in heaven, just one second in heaven, and the worst stuff that's happening with you won't make any difference whatsoever. And the resurrection means all this makes sense to us. So, with that in mind, I rewrote the lyrics to Imagine. <laughs> Imagine there's a heaven, it's easy if you try, where God will meet us and wipe every tear dry. Imagine all the people living in harmony. Imagine there are no tyrants, it isn't hard to do, no one threatening to harm us, and no poverty too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and worship God's holy son. Jesus said it a lot more succinctly and with greater beauty when he said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This excites me. I hope it excites you too. We have more things. Uh, I'm going to take questions in a moment. Uh, I've got resources on my website. 
risenjesus.com. Um, if you speak Spanish, we, we also have a YouTube channel. Just go to Mike Lacona, but if you prefer Spanish, Mike Lacona and Espanol. Um, we've been translating my videos on there, and um, Clay tells me there's a lot of really great educational stuff that they've been doing here at the church. This is great. It's fantastic, actually. And if you're looking for to go for a degree, then I'll just plug HBU, Happenin Baptist University. We got the great Robert Gagnon there, um, New Testament scholar who teaches in the theology. You got the great and wild Jerry Wallace, who, by the way, is single and available. <laughs> And he is a fantastic guy. And any of you single ladies who want to be married to a professional philosopher, you'll never win an argument, okay? <laughs> but he's a great guy. See him afterward for a date. <laughs> well, we have great programs, diplomas, our, our certificates, and master's degrees. You can do it online or on campus. We'd love to have you there. Clay? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Mike. It's great to have you here, and I hope that you guys enjoyed that presentation. If you have written questions while he talked, which I hope you listened to Clay and did that, if you didn't, the next 15 minutes are going to be very much of just me talking. Um, pass those cards in towards the middle aisle. If you've written those down, go ahead and start passing them, and if you forgot, write very quickly, yet legibly. Pass them in, they'll be collected and passed up here. Um, while we're doing that, um, I'm gonna let you just take a break for 15 seconds here. I wanna make you guys aware of two upcoming events that we have that are kind of in this vein. The first is we have another speaker series event. Mark your calendars, Thursday, September 15th. Thursday, September 15th, Alistair Begg will be here. And he is going to talk to us about what he does, which you'll have to tune in to find out what that is. But mark your calendar, September 15th, we will have another great, great mind, a great person um, speaking to us about the things of God. So mark that on your calendars. The next thing I want to make you aware of is a three-week session running between May 11th and 25th on, on Wednesday evenings here at the church, 6.30 to 7.30 in the chapel. We are hosting... Um, I just went completely blank on this man's name. John Hopper, it's right on the card, and I forgot it. I saw, the, I saw Lee Strobel's recommendation and saw Lee, and I was like, we're not hosting Lee. Lee's not coming. We're hosting John Hopper, um, who wrote a book called Questioning God. So if you have questions about God, about theology, about why this all makes sense, or if it does make sense, we encourage you to come on those Wednesday nights. These cards are out there. Um, we would love to have you join us for that. Okay. I will wait for those cards, but I have a question that was texted to me that I'll ask you first because someone was uh, lucky enough to have my cell phone number. So I'm going to ask you this while I sift through these. Um, and you kind of answered this a little bit, but how do you know that the disciples weren't just brainwashed? Like, how do we know that they weren't just brainwashed? We talked about they're not having some, you know, group hallucination, but how do we know they weren't just flat out brainwashed when it came to the resurrection? Well, you'd still have to explain how they came to believe that Jesus had appeared to them. I don't think brainwash really does that. But even if it did, the task of the historian is to be able to account for all of the known facts, okay? And so if all we had was, let's say, the Apostle Peter, that he had an experience or was convinced that the risen Jesus had appeared to him, then we, we could say, well, a hallucination would be plausible, but that's not the case. Uh, you've got all of the disciples who have this belief, and then you have Paul. And it's like, well, wait a minute, Is, it, he's a skeptic. I mean, he hates Jesus. He's trying to destroy the movement. So how could you say that he's brainwashed? If, I mean, he's coming from the opposite direction, right? So that doesn't really account for Paul. Um, really doesn't even account for, we haven't really talked about James, Jesus' skeptical half-brother. The Gospels report, like in Mark chapter 3, that Jesus' brothers at one point thought that he was beside himself. And then in John chapter 7, it says none of his brothers believed in him. Um, and then you, you have at the cross, who does Jesus entrust the care of his mother to? Uh, well, it's not any of Jesus' brothers. <laughs> it's the beloved disciple. Well, why not his brothers? Well, apparently still at the time of Jesus' death, they weren't 
um, I think there's a card down there. Um, at, at the time of Jesus' death, they still weren't believers or else they would have gotten the nod. So what led James then to become convinced after his brother had died as a blasphemer, according to the, the Jewish authorities, um, what would have led him to embrace his brother as the Messiah and Lord? I mean, what would it take to convince you that your brother's the Lord? <laughs> a lot. You know, it's, it's like… Um, a lot. Um, it's… It, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, then he appeared to James. And it seems like a resurrection appearance is the only thing that plausibly accounts for that. So brainwashing just doesn't do a good job of explaining these things. Great. Well, thanks for that. That was great. Um, well, how do you know? You were looking at the question. No, I, so. I can double, I can multitask like crazy. You wouldn't imagine. Um, okay, so this is another question. I've actually seen a few versions of this, but let me go with this. Why is it so important that Jesus rose from the dead? Even if he hadn't, isn't he still the son of God, taught us to love God, love our neighbor, to not, you know, steal, kill, etc.? And most importantly, he died for our sins, even if he went straight to heaven and didn't come back briefly, he still died for us. So why is the resurrection a hinge pin for us? Good question. It's because he made it uh, important. Remember, when he's making these claims and his critics are saying, give us some proof, he says, yeah, all right, you want some proof? My resurrection. So that, that's where the rubber meets the road. It's like if he didn't rise from the dead, then he's a false prophet, right? So he wouldn't be God's uniquely divine son in that sense. And in fact, the apostle Paul himself said, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. And later on in that chapter, he says, look, if I fought wild beast in Ephesus with no more than human hope, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let's eat and, uh, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Get all the sex you want. Get all the weed you want. Um, cheat on your taxes. Cheat on your test. Do anything you want to get ahead and enjoy pleasure in life because this is all there is. Um, so his argument is, if Christ was not raised, we're not going to be raised. If we're not going to be raised, the Christian life is not worth living because it involves sacrifice, it involves persecution for, for, for many, most Christians in the world. And you may even be called to suffer a lot, maybe even martyred for, for the cause of Christ. So if, if we're not going to be raised, the Christian life is not worth living. But Christ was raised, therefore we will be raised, therefore the Christian life is worth living. And that argument only makes sense if they're saying Jesus was actually raised from the dead and it means everything. Everything stands and falls on the resurrection of Jesus. That's why it's important. Amen. Amen. This is a little bit more of a historical type of question. Um, did the Romans initiate a search for the body of Christ? And was that search recorded? Do we have any historical evidence that they actually tried to disprove it themselves? No, we don't have any reports like that. Now, there was a movie made a few years ago, uh, Risen, about how the body goes missing. They're saying Jesus is raised and a Roman tribune is tasked by Pilate to go find the corpse. And it, so it's, it's a fictional account, of course, but it's a fantastic movie, it really is. And it, it's got some, some things in there, the way they have some things like Jesus healing the leper and Jesus appearing to his, I, I'm getting like goosebumps <laughs> thinking of it. Cause, and my favorite scene is when uh, they're fishing it's John chapter 1 at, at the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus appears to them, and they catch a fish, and it's like, oh, I could see that's just how it could have happened. Mm. Just, and I, I get tears in my eyes every time I watch that scene. It is just amazing. So it's a great movie. I don't think it's as good as The Passion of the Christ, but, but yeah. Anyway, that's a, a long, unrelated answer. <laughs> so, yeah, just see the movie. Um, okay, next, next question for us here. It's been said that the discrepancies between some of the, the Gospels are a reasonable evidence or proof that the writings were not, uh, were not a created or coordinated plot. What do, you, what do we think about that? What do you, what do you, how do you comment on that? Yeah, I've heard a number of scholars, Christian scholars say, you know, it, and, and this goes back to like the early church fathers. They said the same thing, that if the accounts were all 
uh, unified and there were no differences, then they, they, the gospel authors would be charged with colluding with one another, collaborating. Um, but there are differences. But the early church fathers wrestled with that and skeptics brought up these things um, and they still do today to say that the gospel accounts are not trustworthy. Now, I've written on the topic in a book uh, that explains why are there differences in the gospels and the title of the book is why are there differences in the Gospels? It's really original. Yeah. It's great. It's great. So, um, and it's a fresh approach to it. Um, so, but, but let's just say there's no answers to these, and you actually have contradictions. I don't think that that is, there might be in a few instances. Um, Robert uh, Gagnon was, brought up a, a few of these before, and there's a couple in the resurrection. There's two in the resurrection narratives that I don't have answers to. I, I, they, they leave me puzzled. I, I don't know what's going on. All the rest of them, I think, can be fairly easily answered. But let's just say, for example, let's just say that there are some contradictions that cannot be reconciled. That might imp have some ramp implications for some Christian doctrines, such as inspiration or inerrancy, although I think uh, those things can be wrestled with and, and addressed adequately. Um, but it's like with the assassination of Julius Caesar. It's reported by Appian, Cicero, Dio, Livy, Nicolaus, Plutarch, Suetonius, and Valias. And you've got tons of different discrepancies in the accounts of Caesar's assassination. But no one turns around and says, well, we can't trust anything about Caesar being assassinated. In fact, we can't even believe that he was assassinated. No, it's just, well... I mean, they... Shakespeare told us, so that's how they know. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, discrepancies... Nobody's saying, well, the tomb was empty. No, the tomb was not empty. Jesus rose. No, Jesus did not rise. Jesus died. No, he survived. His... That's not what's going on. These are just differences in some peripheral details. And no one really looks at these. No historians are going to look at discrepancies in peripheral details and say, oh, well, we can't believe anything these people are saying. No, this is common stuff in ancient literature yeah. and modern. And mo yes. So you referenced one of the books that you wrote. Uh, one of the questions we got is, what's your favorite book that you've written? Do you have one? You know, I, I really like the big book on the resurrection. That's like 700 pages. Um, just because when I was really writing that, I was on a journey to see if I really looked at this as objectively as possible, where would the evidence point? And, and it's like I was on a journey because it's like if... if if I came to the conclusion that there was a better explanation for the evidence than the resurrection, and it was, you know, greatly superior, I couldn't remain a Christian. And I, I was willing to give up my faith. If you couldn't prove the resurrection and it's just kind of like, well, this is kind of interesting stuff, but I can't prove it, I could live with that. But um, I went on this journey and I tried to be as objective and as neutral as possible. And I know a skeptic's not going to believe that, and that's, that's okay if they don't want to believe it. My wife can testify to it, uh, Gary Habermas, uh, William Lane Craig, my doctoral supervisor, Jan van der Vaat, uh, can testify how I wrestled with this stuff. I just wasn't sharing it with people. Um, but it was a journey. So I really, because I really just blood, sweat, and tears into that, in an authentic journey, that, that kind of has a... That, but I also like the book, Why Are There Differences in the Gospels? That was an eight-year study, and it's got some groundbreaking, fresh approaches to gospel differences. So, yeah, I, those are probably my two favorite books. It's hard. I mean, it's like picking your favorite child, right? It's hard to, That's to right. figure it right. You know, it just depends on the day of the week and how they're <laughs> acting at a certain well, The way point, the wind's blowing, know? right? That's right. Okay, someone asked this, which... I've actually been asked this question before, so I'll let you answer it because I may have answered it wrong. They said, you know, Jesus dies on a Friday, not even like Friday morning, but Friday midday-ish. Then we have Saturday. Then he resurrects early Sunday morning. They're like, how do we get three days out of that? Why? It seems more like two, barely. Um, yeah. how, do we, how do we account? Why do we call it three days when it seems to not quite be three days? Or is there, is there a significance there? Yeah, you know, I'm common. That's a common question. I'm asked that a lot. And um, I, I know, now I'm not gonna ask you how you do it. Thank you, uh, thank you, um, yeah. And the only reason is, because you might have the same answer as me, but if you don't, I don't wanna put you on the spot. No, they you know, asked so. you, not me, and there's so. a reason for that, so yeah. <laughs> um, so a lot of evangelicals will try to say, well, the Romans had a different you know, 
way of looking at the days than Jews did, and, or they do it any part of the day can, was considered a whole day, and it's like, no, I, I kind of think some of that's really ad hoc and, and trying to force things. The, the way I, in my research, what I found is that there was a three-day motif in antiquity. We don't use it today, but we have something similar. A temporal figure of speech, like, um, that would take me forever. Well, I don't really mean that. Or, just give me a minute, and it takes me ten. You know, well, I didn't contradict myself. We understand what that means. One minute means a short period of time. Forever means, it could mean an hour, you know. Um, we were talking about this in our class, and Bill, do you remember there was a guy on the discussion forum that he gave a similar example? I forgot what it was. Do you remember that right off now? But it was a, that was a real good one as, as well. Um, and, and just kind of that figure speech, temporal figure speech that we have. Um, the Akkadian literature, medical literature in antiquity, used the three-day motif. A physician would say, well, do this, and in three days you'll be better. But it meant a short period of time. And that makes sense. I think it's a temporal figure of speech, meaning a short period of time. Why? Because you've got Jesus talking about the sign of Jonah in Matthew 12, three days and three nights. Well, if it's Friday, you know, that's not working right, you know. So they try to back up. How can we get three days and three nights in here? Well, I couldn't have been crucified on Friday and raised on Sunday. So what's going on here? Well, then you run into some absurdities because also in Matthew the, Jew, uh, the Jewish leaders come to Pilate after they bury Jesus, and they say, Pilate, we remember when this deceiver was still alive. He said that he will rise from the dead after three days. So give us a guard until the third day, so lest his disciples come and steal the body, and then the, the next deceit will be worse than the first. Well, wait a minute. If he's going to rise from the dead after three days, if that's when they're going to steal his body, why do you want to guard there only in, until the third day? It seems you're going to take that guard away at the very time you need it most. Um, so you got after three days, after three days and three nights, on the third day is said, so what's going on here? Is there contradictions going on? Or is this a temporal figure of speech meaning a short period of time. And to me, that seems to be the, the best explanation, the one that best accounts for how things were treated this way in antiquity. I, I can give one more example real quickly, too. In the book of Esther, you've got um, Haman, who's trying to get a law, and he gets a new law put in place, and he wants to kill Mordecai, who's Esther's uncle, I think it was. And so Mordecai comes to Esther and tells what's going on and says, you know, he's, he's going to kill us and all, all of us Jews with this. And so Esther says, okay, here's what you do. Go back and tell the people to fast for three days and three nights. Fast and pray for three days and three nights. And after that, I will go in to appeal to the king. And it says, and they did as, as Esther had uh, requested and on the third day, she went into the king. That's like, well, this makes perfect sense if it's a figure of speech, meaning a short period of time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense if you're trying to match it in a very precise sense. Gotcha. Well, thank you, Dr. Lacona. We're going we're gonna to wrap up on that. I'm going to make you all aware that we do have some of his books for sale out in the, in the narthex or in the lobby there. We have uh, three different ones. Um, we do have limited copies of each, um, so stampede out there if you want one. He's also been gracious enough to agree to um, sign the books um, if you do purchase one. Just be aware that when you, if, you, if there is a line forming behind you, to, you know, it's not the time to grill him or if you had a question that I didn't get to. Don't let the line form behind you too long or someone will come and help you move. Um, not too forcibly, but we'll see what is necessary. So anyways, thank you all for being here. We're so glad that you've uh, chosen to spend your evening with us. Again, thank you to Dr. Lacona. And feel free to linger. We have some cookies and refreshments out there, and we'd love to chat with you. So we'll see you guys next time. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I thought this you might. Fun.